clarify that, that um, Helmi, the Garden Health has raised nearly $200 million, correct? Yeah, yeah, I think it'll be over $200 million when we're done, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, this last round was over $100 million. Yeah, very impressive, very impressive, and especially what you're doing. So Thank just you. to familiarize the audience with Garden Health, uh, let me take a whack at this. So Garden Health has created Garden 360, which is essentially a simple blood test for monitoring cancer in late stage cancer patients. Basically, it's liquid biopsy. Yeah, exactly. The liquid biopsy has been around since 1950. We've talked about this before. So why in the last five years has it become so much more popular? What's, what's happening that's enabling you to raise $200 million to get this out into the market? Yeah, so, um, well, first off, thank you for having me here, Danby. It's uh, great to be a part of this, uh, this event. Um, you know, I think, you know, maybe kind of, let me backtrack a little bit. So there have been different biomarkers that have been explored for looking at liquid biopsies. And, and the concept behind a liquid biopsy is essentially trying to get a lot of the same genomic and, you know, sometimes proteomic information you would from the tissue tumor itself, from actually physically cutting a piece of the tumor, from a more non-invasive means, basically sampling fluids, either urine or blood and so on. And then we look at blood and the idea, I think what's really happened over the last five years is there's been a confluence of different technologies, different um, you know, um, extraction methodologies and different bioinformatic tools that have really enabled us to get much more sensitive and much more specific in terms of seeing these trace fragments of either DNA or proteins um, that are contained within a tube of blood. And so the whole idea is that any tissue in cancer um, or in, in, in the body that's growing rapidly is also turning over very rapidly. And so when those cells turn over, they die and they release their contents into the bloodstream. Um, and until recently, until you know, we came um, and launched Garden 360, um, off-the-shelf DNA sequencing technologies were not sensitive enough to see these trace fragments of um, DNA in a tube of blood. And so we took a lot of the same concepts behind HDTV over, you know, rabbit ear television, you know, black and white television, or DSL over dial-up modem, which uses the same transmission lines, but through advanced digital communication algorithms are able to get, you know, 100 to 1,000 times better error rate or better, you know, speed. And so we use that same concept on existing DNA sequencing technologies. It's really a marriage between high tech and um, advanced molecular biology that's yeah. enabled this. Well, your background is in genome sequencing. You spent a, a lot of time yeah. there. So talk about how the prices have really gone down to be able to actually sequence the human genome, correct? Yes. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so I, I started working at uh, Stanford in the Genome Technology Center at the tail end of the hum Human Genome uh, Project. And we uh, won some of the first few grants for um, trying to build massively parallel DNA sequencers. So we uh, um, first, I think it was first the $100,000 genome grant, and then it was a $10,000 genome grant, and you know now in, I think, 2013, we're in the era of the $1,000 genome. That first human genome cost, depending on estimates, somewhere between a few hundred million dollars to $3 billion. When was that? Um, that was, you know, 2001, essentially. So um, just about 15 years ago. Um, we've had this enormous decrease in cost, you know, per base, and... Um, what will it be in five years? So I think, you know, I think $1,000 is the, the right packet size. Um, I think our definition of a human genome will change, and so for that $1,000 or a few hundred dollars, we'll get a lot more. The, the human genome we get today, I call it a ground beef genome. Um, it's really like 91% coverage, it's, you know, small little snippets. We don't actually know um, the difference between the, the mother's side and the father's side with you know, high resolution. There's areas at the center of chromosomes, at the end of chromosomes that we're not able to really map um, effectively. And so what will happen is there are technologies that are coming around the corner that allow us to get a more complete picture. Um, the other you know, concept that we're exploring is you know, the, the beauty of our, our blood tests and being able to go in non-invasively in these patients and you know, to monitor, the, monitor cancer is that Cancer doesn't change, I mean, cancer changes, it's not static, essentially. You know, and cancer is defined by alterations in the genome, essentially. It's these, these mutations that happen, you know, in the three billion bases that we sequence inside a cancer cell that really define the cancer. But not only is it different, you know, over time, it's different spatially as well. So it's important to get a complete picture. I do believe that same concept, um, you know, we're going to learn more about the genome itself 
and we're going to find that many diseases are caused by essentially dysynchrony in the different cells and in the genomes. And you know, we have trillions of different cells in our body. They all have you know, conceivably the same three billion bases, but we know that's not the case as you grow older. There are errors that happen in different tissues. So I think our definition of whole human genome sequencing is going to be much more complete than it is today. Right, and I'm sure you'll expand. Right now you're focused on cancer, late yes. stage cancer patients. Right, exactly. Right now you're looking to displace all the tissue biopsies out there. What you're offering right now is a blood draw, which is non-invasive. It's also 25% of what a uh, an invasive surgery would cost. What about the accuracy of the findings? Yeah, so um, we've done concordance studies. We've taken, you know, tissue biopsies from cancer patients across, you know, almost a dozen different cancer types, compared them to, you know, matched blood draws. Um, we have 99.3% diagnostic accuracy, so it's, it's very, very accurate. When we find something, it's specific. Um, it's accurate with the current tissue biopsies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, the, and so the idea is we're not trying to replace the tissue biopsy at diagnosis. It's going to be very hard to replace. It'll be a you know, 10 to 15 year process before, you know, the technologies and our, and our ability to let go of physically seeing cells infiltrating tissue and, and, and in kind of normal tissue and so on and doing the histo histological stains to identify what type of cancer it is. That's going to take some time to displace and the technology has to, has to evolve a little bit for us to be able to displace it. But we're trying, we're basically seeing that we're displacing you know, the repeat biopsies, or when genomic information, you know, wasn't able to be extracted from that initial biopsy. And so, rather than subjecting patients to ten, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 invasive procedures with 20% complication rates, we can come in with a simple blood draw, two teaspoons of blood, get that same information with, you know, 99.3% accuracy, and then hopefully get that patient onto a targeted therapy or another kind of therapy that, you know, hopefully is much more effective than they would have uh, received. All right. Well, I want to talk about, you know, in terms of, yeah. uh, of the market and how many how many you're already doing and how much you're just, how many tissue biopsies yeah. you're displacing. But you talked about therapies, and I read an article about a woman who in June 2013 had a liquid biopsy and the test found a genetic mutation that suggested her disease would be treatable by Novartis, a Novartis drug, Affinitor. Mm -hmm. uh, yet that drug didn't work for yeah. her. So um, when you say 99% accuracy, yeah. is that, does that fall into the 1% that didn't, didn't work? No, so the, it was accurate in terms of identifying the mutation, but you have to remember um, even when a uh, potentially actionable mutation is found, drugs have a certain efficacy rate. And so even some of the blockbuster drugs that have just been approved have anywhere from 50 to 60 percent, um, you know, efficacy in terms of, uh, uh, um, response rate in terms of, you know, when that mutation is on, even in tissue. Um, you know, previous generation of drugs have between 20 to, you know, 40 percent um, response rates. And so, um, unfortunately, you know, we, we improve the odds quite a bit, but, you know, I think the, the missing piece is we don't have enough weapons in the armamentarium in terms of, you know, drugs, effectiveness, and so on. And so that's why this is a tool that is not only helping, you know, the clinical side of getting patients onto potentially more effective therapies, but we need to speed up the rate of how many therapies are getting approved and how effective they are. And this tool is being used by pharmaceutical companies to do just that. So the genetic mutations that you identify, they're only the ones that, are, that have a therapy or a treatment that can go, I mean, you couldn't really say to somebody that you have XYZ and there's no treatment for it. So you're only looking for certain uh, mutations that actually have a treatment that can we, we actually look a little bit more broadly than that. So there are two classes of uh, mutations we see. So we report everything that we find, find that's in the tumor. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the ones that, um, you know, the physician finds more useful are the ones that, you know, are currently actionable, that have a drug that they can, you know, get that patient on, um, that, you know, that, that, that patient is a candidate for. The mutations that aren't actionable um, today are now a signature for that patient's cancer, a personalized biomarker by which you can follow that patient over time. And so one thing we're finding with this test is 
um, were much more effective than you know, other methods for monitoring progression, such as CT scans, serum protein biomarkers like PSA or CEA. Um, it's, we're actually eight to 12 weeks faster in terms of seeing clinical response. And so we believe this is a much more general tool of combining you know, the what of the CT scan. You know, it just tells you the cancer is coming back or it's going away and the why of the biopsy, where it really tells you what's going on at a molecular level. And so with a single test, a single blood draw, we can combine both sides and give the physician a complete view. Right, and you can discover it sooner because you can, you can uh, diagnose it much quicker than traditional, that's what you're saying, than traditional um, procedures. Yeah, so yes, today. our time to treatment can be much, much shorter than the traditional you know, biopsy-based approach. And so where we measured, uh, we have now m multiple publications where we see that um, we cut in half the time it takes from a patient to actually get onto a targeted therapy over biopsy-based approaches. Right. So I want to open this up to the audience. There are two. Wow, we already have an eager person. Okay. Go for it. There's a, there's a microphone over there. So. He has a really intelligent question. When do you see your technology being useful for screening for cancers that are typically not found until stage four, such as pancreatic cancer? Yeah, no, so that's, that's a great question. It's, you know, when we started the company, that was our goal. And I have to say that uh, we have versions of the technology now that are um, almost an order of magnitude more sensitive than what we're using for late stage cancer today, where we're seeing some fantastic results in just those, you know, cancer types. And, uh, you know, you think about it, ovarian, lung, pancreatic, you know, those are cancer types that are typically diagnosed, um, you know, late stage. We don't have, you know, biomarkers, serum protein biomarkers that are very effective there. And so um, if we can essentially dial up the sensitivity of this technology and give those patients and the physicians a shot of detecting them in stage one or two, where hopefully they're more treatable, then um, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's going to be fantastic, and it's, you know, it's where we're going uh, in the very near term, actually. So. Before, before yeah. we get to this, which cancers does your uh, technology work most effectively? Um, so we've, we've looked now at... Um, wow. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> nice to wake us up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so we've looked at maybe 50 different cancer types. Wow. I think that was Crystal. <laughs> so we looked at 50 different cancer types. I think the universality of this technology is that it's based on a property that really defines cancer, which is it grows fast. And so any tissue that's growing fast is also turning over. The one area where we see less sensitivity are brain cancers, so glioblastomas. Um, you know, our sensitivity, instead of being in the 80, 90 percent range, is down at the you know, 30, 40 percent level because of the blood-brain barrier, and that prevents DNA that's being shed from circulating in peripheral blood. But you're replacing a lot more. Um, yeah, if you, look at, if you look at um, the, our um, basically rate of uh, sequencing uh, glioblastomas, it's much higher than the incidence of, of glios, which is only 0.4 percent. Um, and that's because, um, you know, the alternative of doing a, a biopsy is, is pretty, uh, pretty gruesome uh, there in, uh, in, in, in the brain biopsy. So, um, you know, we, I think there are, there are applications. In you, could, you could be looking at cerebral, cerebral uh, spinal fluid, CSF, and sample that and get much higher sensitivity. Um, but, you know, all in all, we, about 95% of cancers we're able to see with this technology with, with very high sensitivity. So. Yes, since uh, the tumors evolve and progress and yeah. change their, yeah. their patterns, therefore your biopsies are going to return a heterogeneous population. How does the clinician use that information in an actionable form? Because you're going to give data that's going to have a different display of different markers, etc. How do you, how do you action, make that actionable? No, no, that's, that's a great, uh, great question. So when you, when you take a typical tissue biopsy, you're looking at one microscopic section of the tumor. Um, you're not getting a complete picture of, you know, the, the whole cancer, a systemic view of what's going on, you know, in these patients. And I'll give you maybe just, you know, a few examples of real patients just to, to hit it home. So we had a patient, um, actually in Israel, that um, we tested about a year ago. And um, 
We found um, basically an EGFR deletion in that patient. The patient was put in erlotinib, had an amazing response. And then about a year later, as many of these patients unfortunately do, he relapsed, but relapsed very suddenly. And his oxygenation levels went down to 85%. Lungs were failing. They told him, uh, you know, this is happening so quickly. Why don't you uh, put your affairs in order? So he flew to Romania to buy a gravesite next to his sister. And, uh, you know, they had done another Garden 360 test. Um, when he came back, the results were ready. We found a MET amplification now that was not present initially. And uh, Kritzotinib is a, is a drug that works for that. So he's put in Kritzotinib. We got the PET CTs back, you know, just, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And the patient uh, basically is at performance status zero, which means they're, you know, given a clean bill of health, they can go back to work and so on. And um, so it's, it's pretty fantastic to see this new era of multiple shots on goal. So that's the, that's the, you know, the temporal evolution aspect where you can come back in, resample, and figure out, figure out what the next, you know, best shot that patient has. Um, there are other examples where we had another patient who had an ALK fusion. Um, and so the, you know, the, the patient was put on Kritzotinib again. And then there's a mutation that basically um, causes a resistance to Kritzotinib that we detected, um, you know, when we, when we tested again. And so the patient was put in Seretinib. And then, you know, we tested the patient again after they, you know, progressed. And then uh, they had another mutation that, you know, was resistance to Seretinib, but actually resensitizes the Kritzotinib. And uh, so the patient was put back in Kritzotinib, um, and it started working. So, but the beauty of the test is we see a superposition of all the mutations there, and it's quantitative. So when you look at the results of that patient, you see the original driver at the highest percentage, and then you see these follow-on resistance mutations at lower and lower percentages. And so um, it's really a fundamentally new tool of seeing a complete picture of these cancers and really designing, you know, what the next best step is. You know, part of what we do is we're building a database of, you know, one of the largest databases of metastatic disease. And because it's quantitative, um, we're able to, you know, build what we call ways for cancer. Can, you know, can, can you predict you know, the roadmap that these cancers are likely to take and, you know, put these patients on treatment pathways that, you know, hopefully avoid some of the traffic jams, you know, down the road. Hello, I'm Jamie Robinson, Professor at Berkeley. I uh, wasn't clear from your comments how far you're beyond in non-investigational clinical uses in the United States. Yeah. Assuming you are, could you briefly describe the, the, the regulatory pathway you went through with the FDA to, to get in comparison with the, the other pathological markers? And then assuming you got through that, where you are in terms of uh, reimbursement uh, coding me at Medicare and or the private plans? Sure. No, it's a great question. Um, so the test um, has been commercial now uh, and been in clinical use for almost two years. Um, it's an LDT, so it's, uh, it's gone the CLIA cap uh, route. Um, we are uh, in discussions with the FDA right now um, because we work with a lot of pharmaceutical companies in terms of them building their companion diagnostics on top of Garden 360 so that patients can have better access to advanced uh, drugs without having to go through a biopsy. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the, the test has been one of the fastest adopted tests in um, oncology history. Um, we went um, from zero to 20,000 tests a year in uh, under uh, 18 months. We, um, you know, have seen, um, you know, almost 20% of oncologists have, you know, used the test now and, and growing. Um, we sequence, you know, the most lung cancer patients of, you know, any center, you know, in the United States or any company in the United States um, through, through blood biopsies. Um, and that's even in comparison to people who do it through tissues. So um, we're just seeing an amazing sweet spot in terms of lung cancer and being able to get patients to the standard of care that they deserve. Um, in terms of, um, you know, obviously the diagnostic lab, you know, the most important thing is, is reimbursement and getting paid for the test. Um, you know, with private payers, we work with uh, patients insurance to um, essentially recoup as much as we can, you know, on their behalf, and we're, uh, we've had pretty good success there. With Medicare, we're still in discussions um, um, with our uh, MAC, um, basically, uh, Palmetto and, and Noridian, and those conversations are going really well. Um, you know, I think there's, there's something that's important, you know, that, that I've found is, 
you know, there's this concept of drip, you know, data rich, information poor, or, you know, we, we, th we somehow conflate, you know, information and, and data with utility. And, you know, the, so our test is very targeted. We're not trying to boil the ocean and, you know, find every possible marker that's there, which may be interesting from a research setting. We're really going after bringing that patient to the guidelines that the NCCN have dictated. And so we've done studies where we found that something like only 50% of lung cancer patients have EGFR and ALK, which are the two basic you know, uh, biomarkers that are, that are there. And then there are seven biomarkers that are recommended by the NCCN. EGFR and ALK are two of them. If you go to the next five, it's only about 10 to 15% of patients that have had um, those markers genotyped. And so the beauty of our test is it's the only liquid biopsy on the market today that's able to get all seven, um, all, everything that's dictated or that's um, you know, recommended by the NCCN um, with two teaspoons of blood. And, and so, since, so our value proposition is essentially not trying to boil the ocean. It's just getting those under-genotyped patients up to the standard of care that they deserve, whether that they're at Memorial Sloan Kettering or in a community oncology center you know, in the middle of the country. No, no, you're your um, technology really applies to the one million cancer, late stage cancer yeah, patients. Yeah, right now. When, yeah. when do we get to a point where you can address the 15 million cancer survivors or you can get a blood draw if you're healthy and, and get early detection of potential cancer? Yeah, so we, we have uh, active programs in both those applications and the results are, are very promising there. But we've had some use cases where you know the test has been used for you know, breast cancer survivors and so on. And um, we found some amazing results there where we were able to detect recurrence, you know, six months before any other means. And so our test essentially allowed that physician to be very vigilant because we started seeing markers coming back up. And uh, as soon as, you know, I had one patient um, in, in Philadelphia who um, essentially found a um, uh, well, we found a mutation that had come up, and then three months later they did a scan, and they found a small metastasis on her spine. They were able to remove it, but you, know, you never know if that eventually metastasizes to the brain, where it really becomes untreatable at that point. And so, um, all those patients have been very, you know, grateful for this technology and for you know the this opportunity of active surveillance that we can uh, afford, you know, their physician and themselves. So, I'm sorry, so you said that you, did, you ran a test and yeah. a blood draw and you were able to detect uh, breast cancer six months earlier than an, an alternative test? Than a CT scan or PET CT, yeah. Okay, yeah. and yes. that was pretty accurate. No, it was. We've, we've had now a number of these cases in the, in the research setting where these That's tests are being, you know, used, you know, in clinical trials. Obviously, we're not going to find every case before, you know, other methods, but um, if we can at least, you know, add a, provide an additional safety net for those patients and give them quantitative peace of mind, as we call, as we call it, then uh, it's much better than what exists today. So you've raised nearly $200 million. Yeah. You certainly have a war chest. About $100 million is relatively new. I think yeah. that was earlier this year. Yeah. But there are other companies out there, BioCEF, they went public in 2014, Randance Technologies. Uh, this is a pretty big market, and in some ways they can validate what you're doing. Um, or it could be a, a huge market and everybody can be, uh, can, um, and, and we need all of the groups, all of the companies to satisfy the demand out there. But how do you stay ahead? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think if someone had told me, you know, three years ago that um, two years after we launched our test, we would still be the only company with a comprehensive liquid biopsy in the market, yeah. I would be very surprised. So there's a lot of noise out there. There's, you know, you look at Genome Web or you look at other publications, it seems like there's a new liquid biopsy company coming out every year. And for good measure, it's, you know, all the, you know, JP Morgan and Piper Jeffrey, all the banks are estimating this to be a 20 to $40 billion, you know, market opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, everyone wants to get a piece of it, but we estimate we have 100% of the li comprehensive liquid biopsy today and at least 80 to 90% of the overall liquid biopsy market. So there's a lot of what appears to be, you know, noise in the media, but, you know, not an actual, you know, tests that are on the market yet. You're creating yeah. a lot of that noise, by the way. You're, you're <laughs> published all the time. Tim, you're doing a great job. Tim, the publicist. 
So last question, yeah. there's, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out here. I think the healthcare industry is one of those industries where there's a lot of challenges That's as true. a startup. So what was the biggest challenge for you? What can you, what can the audience take away as they're building their companies? Yeah, so I think it comes back to, you know, especially when, you know, I'm an engineer, you know, by, by original training, and I think what's great about, you know, Silicon Valley here is we're finally seeing a lot of, um, you know, tech-minded folks thinking about healthcare and, you know, jumping into the space, but, um, you know, it's not just about technology. You know, if you look at most of the successful healthcare companies, technology has probably been the thing they've been least competent at. Um, it's really five or six different things that have to go right. It's, you know, as someone brought up, it's the reimbursement, it's regulatory, it's a commercial, it's, you know, dealing with, you know, medical affairs and clinical utility, you know, all these studies that you have to, you have to run. And technology is one of five or six different, you know, segments that are important. So it's really having a holistic picture there. And I think the, the second thing is, is humility. Um, you know, I don't think this company would have been successful if I didn't fail multiple times, uh, you know, during my PhD in terms of different, you know, ideas and different things. And, you know, there's a certain amount of, um, you know, hubris sometimes that, you know, people from the tech space have in terms of going into healthcare. And, you know, it's, it's good. I mean, we, we should have, you know, more ideas and, and you know, you know, borrow as much as we can from the tech side to solve some of these important healthcare challenges. But these challenges exist um, because they're hard challenges. And so we should remember that, you know, cancer is not something that, you know, is going to go away anytime soon. Um, we're we're going to, you know, move the needle. We're going to, you know, make things better. But um, we should understand that, you know, the, you know the, the more we find out about cancer, the you know, the less we, we actually know. I mean, it's just, it's just even physics, you know, 93% of the universe is dark matter and dark energy, which we don't have, which we, you know, don't have any clue, you know, what it is. And so um, it's going to be the same thing, you know, with cancer. Maybe the final kind of take-home message is what I call PPP, the make sure you have the patient, um, physician, and payer, you know, value proposition in mind and in alignment there, both from a utility aspect and from an economic aspect. You know, there are a lot of tests that are good, but if they're going to take money out of the, you know, the hands of, you know, either the, the payer or the physician or so on, then it's going to be hard. You're, you're basically moving uphill there. So it's, it's important to have that holistic view about where your technology fits. Great final lesson. Oh. Tell me, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.